Oh, what a joy to be here today. Um, Woke up to this verse, which I really felt was appropriate for all of us. Habakkuk. How many of you have memorized the book of Habakkuk, be honest? (laughs) How many never knew it was in the Bible? Okay. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. You know, I think about um, having been saved in a revival that was extraordinary, a move of God that branded me, that affected my life. There's a dear friend who's watching from another state right now who called me early this morning around uh, 4 in the morning, and I finally got back to him about 5.30, and we were talking yesterday. I was on my lunch break, and uh, we... um, we talked yesterday about the revival that we got saved in, and he just fa- figured it out yesterday that he got saved a week after me in 1972. And I've heard that over and over again. I've heard it over and over again. People, there was a sovereign moment when God did something extraordinary and ushered in a whole bunch of folks. And um, I know we have seen moves of God here at The Rock, and I know The Rock will see many more moves of God. And uh, a whole other generation is going to, be raised up like we had no idea. But this dear brother who shared with me this morning said, the thing that, he just read my book, Perfectly Positioned, he said, just in finishing it, he said, the thing, because it talks about that move of God, is the innocence. We didn't know anything. We had no significant theological bent. All we knew is Jesus saved us. And we went out and told people, do you, you know, do you know the Lord? Have you met Jesus? And... That's what we had. We built on that, but that was the main event. And uh, today, Jesus showed up in worship. Jesus was here today, encouraging us with his presence. Uh, To me, that is the acid test for anything. Uh, If God's showing up, uh, we're in the right place, and we come with the right heart. Um, This message is moving. You know, I I tried to get all my tears out prior to this message, and I trust (laughs) I'll be able to do that. Uh, I don't think it's always helpful when my Italian comes out and I begin to cry. So, um, but uh, it is very moving and very emotional for me to share. Um, the message is the importance of a generational handoff. Um, the reality is all of us are passing the baton on to someone else. Uh, ultimately, that will happen. Uh, our daughters in the first slide, um, they were part of the rock in the early innings. And... Uh, we tried to pass a baton on to them, and they were a great influence in the early days. Uh, they're now married. They have uh, magnificent children, um, and uh, each of their families, the next one is Havilland, her kids, and then Daniel and Deborah. Um, and then, you know, that baton, every one of us will pass that baton on. And this picture of the baton really shows um, a problem, okay? That's not how they pass batons. They don't, if you've ever watched it, they don't just like throw it at the person ahead of them um, or behind them. They, they ultimately uh, have to get it in their hand. And uh, some of the, this is, a, this is an Olympic race here. This is like the best of the best in the world. People have done this a thousand times, but they miss the handoff. And now they love that picture. They have, that, they have a large picture of this in their living rooms just so they never forget that moment. Another picture here, another example of that. Uh, whoops, where is the baton? Down there to the right. What's wrong with that picture? Not their best moment. And then the last one, there's a, there's a, a space there. There's actually 10 meters uh, when you are passing it off and 10 meters when you're receiving it. So you've got to get it in their hands in the first 10 meters, and then you've got to let go of it by the end of the second 10 meters. And if you miss that right there, that's a bad moment right there. Uh, they didn't get it there in time. And so um, I certainly have seen churches where the baton was not passed. I've seen families where the baton didn't get passed. And that, you know, it burdened me because in my generation, uh, I wanted to make sure I passed it. Uh, but every generation ultimately needs to pass that baton, and all of us will do that. We'll all pass it off. And so the question is, are you ready to pass off 
what you've been given. Um, all of us have been given something. Um, some things are not worth passing off. My father had things I didn't want. I didn't want them in my life. I have other dimensions that my dad had that I, whether I like it or not, I've got his temperament. I, um, I know generationally um, large noses run in my family. I just know that it's just been <laughs> passed on. So, but are we ready also to receive a baton? You know, it, when I got saved, uh, our generation wasn't fully ready for that. Genesis chapter uh, 26 says this. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which Abraham's servants had dug in the days of his father, Abraham, his father. And they had filled them with earth. And, and there's something that happens, you know, in my own heart. I, just in talking about the revival uh, yesterday and today, just remembering that with someone who was there. Um, I know that some of those things that were so precious, I'm still trying to get back in my life. You know, when Jesus talked about returning to your first love, um, I don't get a pass on that. I, don't, I can't remind Jesus how wonderful the move of God was. I have him today. I've got to have a fresh relationship with him today. And um, at this point, something was stop, stopped up. Something was filled just with earth. And there's a lot of earth happening right now, uh, a lot of earth happening on the planet, a lot of conversations uh, that, especially in the mediums of this age, that are very different than when I got saved. I mean, literally, we had no contact with outside news for a long time. We had no idea, sincerely, what was going on in the world. Uh, pigeons would fly by and drop messages <laughs> off periodically, but ultimately we did not know what was taking place. Uh, now, you know, you have to fight to not be bombarded with stuff that is often a lot more bad news than good news, a lot more contamination of thought than uh, peaceful thought. And um, you can get a potentially a fatalistic view of life. You know, your, your heart can be filled up with earth, so much earth that you lose sight of heaven. I don't want my heart filled with earth. I want my heart filled with heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm only passing through here. This is like a touch and go here. I'm here for a few more minutes, then I'm gone. Uh, our life on earth, if the day of the Lord is a thousand years, then I'm here for about two hours total. That's it. So I've got a half hour or less to go. So that's as much time as I'm spending here. The rest is in eternity. Um, and so I want to be ready uh, for the baton being passed. And so the next slide talks about that generational uh, well that was dug. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. There was something, there was an anointing, there was an impartation, there was a deposit that Isaac wanted to redig that generational blessing, generational favor. Uh, I, I want that revival to hit our lineage, my natural and my spiritual lineage. I want the, the move of God to come that is so sweeping that just like I'm talking about it 46 years later, they'll talk about it when they're older men. <laughs> D.L. Moody um, got saved in the 1857 uh, prayer meeting revival. Um, he led a million people to Christ during his lifetime, which was amazing. But on his deathbed in 1899, as he was dying, all he, could talk, all he could talk about was the 1857 revival, that he so wanted God once again to do what took place uh, some 42 years before. And it did happen, 1904 in Wales, 1906, Azusa. He didn't see it. His um, worship leader, Ira Sankey, did see it. He got to lead in the Welsh revival, lead worship. Uh, and so there's a generational baton that we're, we're all in the process of being revived in our own hearts that those around us can be awakened. Uh, but I want to be ready for that. I want to dig those wells in my own heart. And I found in our generation, many of the older people were not ready to receive us. When they were praying for a move of God, and Susie's grandma was one of six little ladies praying for revival. Um, and uh, when it came in, in the form of 18 barefoot hippies, they were thinking, mm, that was not what I was praying for. <laughs> and so four old ladies left. Mrs. Carney stayed. She was in her 90s, stayed. And then Susie's grandma had a stroke. 
We would visit her for years. She couldn't be around. Um, but the move of God did come. And so the questions that we're ready for, uh, in our revival, these are the folks, what they look like there. This is them. This was the first batch. This is part of that 18. Now, I know you guys, if you saw them walk in your church, you'd say, promising. <laughs> these people. If anyone's going to succeed, it's got to be these people. The guy on the left was the biggest drug dealer in the county. He was a ranger in Vietnam. He was my second pastor. I went with him on a team to Lake Tahoe in 1974. And he died in 1976. I took care of him the last month he was alive. He died of cancer from Agent Orange, probably in Vietnam. Uh, Lou Benninger still has a radio show next to him in uh, uh, Yuba City. Uh, these guys were wild. The guy on the right, when the police came to their house, he took out the first cop with a cross body block. They, they were not promising. <laughs> but the next slide... <clears throat> they cleaned up. Good things happen. <laughs> the guy on the right, the guy in the middle is a pastor of a church in Lake Tahoe right now. That same church we went to, he's been pastoring there for 40 years. The thing is, would you recognize the next move of God? Would you embrace those who God would send? I'll cry over that. Because it won't be warm and fuzzy. You won't be going, absolutely, voted most promising in his class. That's what God does. The, 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 the Pharisees couldn't believe the disciples. These are unlearned and ignorant men. How, they, how could God choose these? And yet that's what God does. So what's needed for the next generation to follow Jesus? They must know that we believe in them even though they don't look like us. They may not do it like us. They may not think like us. They may not share like us. But will we embrace the next generation? This is a picture of that revival. Um, that is my father in the Lord <clears throat> doing that little triangle. <laughs> he was a virtuoso on that triangle. <clears throat> I remember his triangle solos were just unbelievable. <laughs> Actually, in truth, I, I never saw him do that. I have no idea where that picture came from. <laughs> That's purely absurd. He was the most straight-laced guy in the world. I, I, he never had a drink. He had never been to a movie. I mean, this guy was carved out of time. And yet when Susie received the Lord... I mean, this man went to that house where those, that gang was and came there just, you know, white shirt, short sleeve, walked up there and just manifested the life of Jesus. And so when the, he was, now he was really old. He was 38. <laughs> and I remember, I was 23 when I got saved, that man thinking, Jerry is so old. <laughs> now, he was an old soul. He was. But he was a young man. I mean, I, when we pastored, our first pastor, for, when we pastored in 1977, I, we was 20, I was 28, she was 27. We pastored for four and a half years, a live in, that live-in community. Um, but that was a move of God. That was precious. Um, most of them were young people. They cleaned up. They, they, they dragged on in. Many just hitchhiked through. We'd baptize 15 every Sunday in the middle of nowhere, Smartsville, 200 people in a little town. No air conditioning. You'd sweat, sweat would go down your shirt, pants, middle of summer, tin roof. Next picture, this is my father in the Lord, Jerry, this summer. That's that man, 85 years old. Wife passed away, dear man. We sat in his home. And he just, again, we'd always kid, Jerry would levitate. Jerry was like the perfect guy. He's a bit of a mystic. Uh, and for those of us coming out of Eastern religions, we needed someone a little <laughs> mystical, you know. We needed someone who would just love us. He just loved us. And we were not, um, you know, clear in our heads. We were smoking a lot of dopey, and uh, that'll make you dopey. But this man is a dear man. He showed me Jesus, and I, you know, I, I pray I could have the, the love of Jesus that he has in his life. So are you ready for the revelation of the next generation? 
that will look different, maybe act different, think different, certainly. Um, are you ready to fight for the next generation, not fight with the next generation? What's needed for the next generation? We must have a multi-generational vision. Um, God's always building on generations. It's very important that we hold on, that we don't give up on the next generation, um, and that those of us who are younger don't give up on the previous generation. We can learn from them. Here's a picture um, a couple years into the revival. This is Morningstar. This is the place Susie and I were married in this little building. Um, and uh, this is a batch there. There's Susie on the right. See there, the cute little thing right there. <laughs> this is before she and I got together and got married. So the glow is not quite as bright as it would be <laughs> a, little, a little later on. <laughs> but Susie came up on the second wave of the church planting in Lake Tahoe. We fell in love. But this, these are, everyone's probably under 30. You know, when I got saved, that community we lived in, the oldest person by September, I got saved in May with 10 people living. By September, there were 75 people. The oldest person in that community was nine months from the Lord. This was the seasoned sage that you'd ask hard questions to. And then they would draw from their wealth. Well, back in November, they would just draw <laughs> from the legacy of insight they had. Next slide is two years ago in Lake Tahoe. A bunch of folks, there's Susie and I over there, the arrow. Got together again, you know. Um, not all are serving the Lord. Some have come and gone. But uh, many have been etched with the, the character of God and still are serving God wherever they are. They came from various places. Judges chapter 7. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. That's why I say I've only got 40 more good years. <laughs> 40 more good years. Judges 2.10 says, after that, I'd love, love it to be positive, but it's not always. Um, that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors. Another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And this is why it's so important that we fight for the next generation. Sometimes if you give up on the next generation, they may not know how valuable they are. And they're priceless. They are gold. Um, the rock has really been spoiled with generational blessings, it really has. We have seen over and over again the Lord be faithful uh, in moving among our young people. And that's where revivals always come. The fact is all historic revivals happen among the young. So the best shot many of us have is being dads and moms in the next move of God. If we don't want that role, if we abandon our children, if you will, then we may not see the move of God. As an evangelist, I traveled for 18 years prior to pastoring now for 21 years. And I'd go to churches, and I was equipping them to reach the lost. And some churches had, you know, lots of young people. But some, I would go in, and it was an old folks' home. And literally, they had no young people left. And these beautiful folks would look at my eyes and say, how do we get our young people back? And I basically told the revival story, you need a miracle. Because kind begets kind, and you've lost all your young people. You did not keep them when they were here. And so we want to keep our young people, amen, right? Okay, so that's it. Otherwise, you'll be a little old lady praying for God to do something unusual, and then you might not have the grace to, to nurture it when it shows up. Um, <clears throat> ten, uh, I'm sorry, not eight years ago, Luis Palau <clears throat> came and did a festival here, um, at that point, City Pastors Fellowship had grown from just a Roseville pastors group to all of Sacramento. Luis Palau, being a great evangelist, um, brought together 420 churches from the area. I knew when that happened that my role was not going to just be as a local pastor, but also in the region. And so um, at that point, I had um, a conversation with Pastor Bob and said, he was the associate pastor here, been a senior pastor in Washington for many years. Um, 
And so I asked him to be the co-senior pastor. He was bugging me for months about wanting to do that. And uh, finally, I just said, okay, Bob, we'll do it. No, actually, it's the last thing he wanted. So, uh, but I, I increased my intercessory prayer life because Bob did not want me to die at that point because he didn't want to be the senior pastor. So, but that then, uh, the Lord gave me a prophetic uh, word that um, as I have physical twins, and I was a twin. Equity is very important. I have a twin brother. I have twin daughters. And so that the rock and the region would be my twins. And so at that point, I divided my time between the rock and the region. Equity is very important with twins. Um, and so at that point, that lasted for a number of years until I realized about four years ago, um, I finally shared with the leadership that I didn't have the rock next vision and that it would not be fair just to hang around. At that point, uh, Pastor Brandon um, had been leading youth uh, for a number of years, done a great job, and had, I forget the exact sequence, but had begun to come on in uh, communicating as a teaching pastor. So he was involved in that. We could see as elders that he had the grace to lead. He was 31 at that point, uh, just felt there would be a little more time uh, that in my departure, that we wanted to get the body ready for that transition. And candidly, it has been really, uh, I think, a very healthy transition in that it was announced about two years ago, and then gradually the plane has been landing, gradually coming down, um, and actually quite smooth, uh, amazingly. And so we announced it two years ago, but Susie and I did not know uh, even what our next was until about a year ago. And even now, we're not fully aware. So you can't wait. Uh, and this is what's happening right now, even in the churches in America. They estimate that 70% of all pastors will step down in the next five years. Whether they like it or not, they will step down. And so uh, sometimes uh, the baton will be pried out of their fingers. Other times they will have passed it on. And my hope is that pastors would think ahead, understand the importance of uh, passing a baton on, believing in the next generation, affirming them and encouraging them. Uh, but that will happen. And so uh, the challenge, though, for all of us uh, about the future is that we can look toward the future with fear, trepidation, and security. Uh, I remember when we got saved. Um, you know, we had come out of a Woodstock generation, uh, which was crazy, guys, okay? Uh, you know, uh, and even we realized it was crazy. Those of us who were a part of it felt this is crazy. This is not safe. This is not stable. And then we got saved. We said, now we know why we felt it wasn't safe and stable. Um, and so we... Uh, then wondered, you know, because the world, it looked like Jesus could come back at any moment. Uh, we had lengthy discussions. Should we even get married? If we did get married, should we even have children? What if the Lord comes back? Why even do that? Um, and now, ironically, we are much closer to his return. Um, and even uh, Francis Chan spoke a couple weeks ago to us as pastors in the region and said, now there's less talk about the end times than there was in the 1970s. And yet we are decades closer to it. Uh, who knows, you know, when Jesus might come back. But um, ultimately, the reality is we will pass that baton on. And none of us can, should give in to doubt and fear and insecurity or self-preservation to hold on to it. Uh, I believe my future is bright because I trust the person who wrote the script for my future. I believe the Rock of Roseville's future is bright because I trust the person who wrote the script for the Rock of Roseville. I'll even go so far as to say I believe your future is bright if you will trust the, run, the one who wrote the script for your life. He saves the best wine for last. God is, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond all you could ask or think. If you will trust him for that, I believe that with all my heart. Now, the hard part at times in each of our lives is that when, when, when the tide is low, it's high, hard to believe in high tide. Uh, a relative uh, is a stockbroker, and he says the hard part uh, is that people want to buy when the stock is high, and that's not the time to buy. And they don't want to buy when the stock is low because they're insecure. But that's the time. It's counterintuitive. And so revivals always happen when the tide is low. That's when the wave is about to come in, the tsunami is about to come in. And so the challenge is being able to discern that, not giving up in your own personal life, not in your corporate life when there's a low tide moment. 
Um, Susie and I are excited about The Rock. I'm excited for Brandon and Rachel. I believe in them. They are an amazing couple. Uh, they are amazing parents. They have amazing children. They are raising up extraordinary leaders. I'll talk more about that. But I'm excited about their future. I'm excited about your future if you're believing in the God that I believe has something exceptional for you as well. But not everyone handles it, in the Bible even. There's a king named Hezekiah. Um, Hezekiah had been blessed by God. He did some magnificent things. But when uh, messengers from Babylon came, spies came, he showed them all of his treasury. And when, when Isaiah came to him and said, what have you done? Um, he said, you will lose everything. And he did. He lost everything. His children, as a matter of fact, uh, ultimately, his children uh, had their, uh, they were castrated. And, and they were ultimately carried away as young slaves into Babylon. But the Bible says, when Isaiah heard that word from the prophet, he said this. Uh, Hezekiah said, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. Isn't that awesome to have a parent that could care less about what happens to you? Because they blew it. But at least they have peace in their day. So the question is, what's needed for the next generation to follow Jesus? We're called to raise up a confident next generation who know God believes in them, and so do we. It's not a question of uh, me fully understanding all that's ahead, or me fully understanding every decision my natural or spiritual children will make. Uh, they're facing a different world. They're wired differently. And, and just in my discussions with older people, as I do, uh, what I say to them is the next generation, because of the world they are facing and because of their journey, has established different priorities as to what is really important to them. And they're going to fight for those things. And some of those, pro in other words, I was part of a church growth movement where you were building bigger, more services, you know, the more people you reached. Well, this generation wants better relationships and closer relationships and tighter family. They're not just into wide and narrow. They want, you know, deep. They want something that's profound. And it's because uh, the world that's bombarding them um, is very shallow and very superficial. And they don't want to be a part of that. They want something deep and lasting. And you know what? It's better. It's better. It's different than I was wired for. And sometimes I find myself going back into the church growth mode. We'll do this. It's strategic. And I get into, you know, something that would kind of, you know, move the chess pieces around but may not be as genuine and as authentic and may be cause a watering down of something that is very special. Um, I, the revival that took place in my life was not because of a church growth movement. It wasn't because someone came through and bigger, better. Uh, we didn't even have a microphone in our church. We didn't have air conditioning. There was nothing sophisticated. We had love feasts sitting on the side of the road because there were no tables, and there were no chairs, and we sat on gravel. But there was a move of God, and people brought their potluck, and they set it up on a little you know, table outside the church, but there was nowhere to sit. We just wanted to be together, and it was special. You know, I've got two daughters, and uh, both of them, we have two daughters, are mentoring us. These are a picture of our daughters. This is preparing one of the series I was doing. Havel on the left there was guiding me how to do this, teaching me how to teach. <laughs> and I was sitting, taking notes. Deborah, as well, is a health coach, and she, has, she mentors us. She mentors us. Are you ready for the next generation to mentor you? It's challenging. I'm, <laughs> we had a conversation yesterday with Deborah. I guess it was yesterday. And I was kind of balking at something, and she got right in my face. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I went, mm, that's different. And uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a gracious thing, but she was strong. Yeah. And she said, no, Dad, that's not, that's not what we're doing. <laughs> okay. <You> know, <laughs> 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 and I walked away going, you know, she's right. 
She's right. You know, I, again, I love my daughters. I'm just proud of them. I'm proud of the next generation. Havila on the left here has had over a million downloads of her podcasts. Deborah and Daniel spoke on video Zoom to 2,000 leaders a couple weeks ago from every state. Next slide, Havila in, in Norway saw 500 young people come to the Lord on that stage. Next slide, Havila as well in another meeting, you know, reaching out. My daughter said to me years ago, they said, Dad, uh, your ceiling is our floor. And I'm going... <laughs> You know, I wanted them to be blessed, but the statement was a little, you know, I just never wanted to be a floor for somebody. And what they were saying was, thank you, Dad. Just like Elisha asked Elijah and got a double portion. They, they said, you know, Dad, you've given us a good deposit, Mom, a good deposit, but we're going to take what you have and go further. And I appreciate that. Um, Brandon and Rachel, our ceiling is your floor. What we have, build on it, and you're going to go far beyond. You know, you're a little old, yeah. so don't be discouraged. You still only have 30 or 40 more good years before you're my age. I'll be 105 when you're my age, so I'll be drooling right there in the front row. Or drooling from heaven, I'm not sure, but drooling from someplace. But our prayer is that you will excel far beyond us. Our ceiling is your floor. That's what we're believing for. So will you be part of the remnant of the next generation who will wholeheartedly follow Jesus and help the next generation? Are you ready to receive the next generation? Are you ready to let them lead? Even as a brand new Christian, and again, in that day of revival, we sent out people, I mean, that was two years in the Lord, sent out to, to pastor, lead a church. We were babes. But those who sent us out taught us, they said, the best way to raise up an elder is to trust him, to speak life, to encourage him, to encourage the next generation that I believe in you. It's always only a remnant. Numbers chapter 32, then the Lord was very angry with them. He said, of all those I rescued from Egypt, no one who is 20 years old or older will ever see the land I swore to give them. The old guys and gals were not ready, for they had not obeyed me wholeheartedly. The young ones went in. The old ones didn't. The young ones got the handoff. The old ones didn't. Verse 12, the only exceptions are Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and the Kenazite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholeheartedly followed the Lord. And, you know, it was Caleb who said when he was 80, give me that mountain. And so um, I am believing my best days are ahead. I would like you to believe your best days are ahead. Now, I will not do, I may not, you know, be able to run as fast, think as quickly. Uh, but I believe that what God has given me is a, is a wealth that I can still share. And what God has given you is a wealth as well. In our region, we have seen something similar. There's a couple, Don and Krista Proctor, um, who are leading City Pastors Fellowship. Don just heard 50. And, uh, but he started doing that in his 30s, leading pastors in the region a lot older than he was. Um, this is another pastor in the, in the region. I will be at his swearing in, uh, Les Simmons. His dad, Esley, and Deborah are dear friends. Um, but November 11th, he'll receive the baton to take over the church from his dad. Um, in our region as well, here's a businessman, Kwame Angu, a dear friend at the MLK March this past year. And then even city officials, Chief Han has been a wonderful man. We have the same heart. He was the police chief of Roseville. He's the police chief of Sacramento. When he went to Sacramento, next slide, uh, this Esley Simmons right there. Uh, that's his dad, welcoming him with the city pastors and uh, praying over him in that gathering. And the next slide, um, having a meeting with African-American pastors, praying over 
Daniel Hahn, just affirming him, setting up that meeting, encourage them to receive him, embrace him. Um, in this region, a number of years ago, I got together with Lance Hahn, and here's a, a picture of him. That's Lance on the left there. And um, when, when I first had lunch with Lance, maybe eight years ago, he said, you're the sanest person in the crazy wing, which I felt that was a great <laughs> encouragement. So I really enjoyed that. So um, I knew within a year or two that whatever b baton I had, I'd be passing to him. And we talked about that. And um, this past spring, we had a gathering at a, the Home of Peace in Oakland and uh, just passed my water bottle, if you will. Just did a little symbolic thing with him. But we're all going to pass that baton. But the rock always has been. Here's a picture of young people at the rock. Um, that We've always focused on young people. There's some more pictures. Another picture is the next one is uh, a, a baby dedication a little while ago. All kinds of children dedicated. Then we had those who were 30 and under come stand on the platform. So we've always had a lot of young people here. Um, and then um, here's another picture of the, of the youth at the Rock praying over me at one point. Uh, just, just the youth have always been strong here. Generationally, guys, boomers, here's how it works, okay? Boomers um, are myself, 55 to 75 years old. Then there's a Gen X generation, 37 to 54, and millennials, 18 to 36. Brandon and Rachel are kind of on the cusp of millennials to Gen X. They really are, though, millennial-esque. And I would say that things are changing very quickly. And so uh, there are folks in this room in their early 20s who don't fully understand what teenagers are thinking, okay? And so we've talked about that. They still don't understand exactly what's going through the mind of people a few years younger. It's a generational process. This generation is facing brand new things that um, we didn't have to face. And so that baton is being passed. Here's a picture of Brandon uh, way back when. Uh, now that's not when he was 17, but uh, that's as old as I could find, but him with some of the other young people uh, there. He's now really old. He's 35. <laughs> but he was a leader back then. He was a leader uh, throughout his 20s um, and been a leader here. Here's another picture of young people here. Um, you're no, not too young to be used by God. Uh, I'm blessed by the, the young men and women that we have at the Rock that are mighty, yeah. that are here to pray at the end, that are ready to move in the Spirit of God, that are leading in worship. Uh, they're mighty, um, and you're also not too old. I remember when the great mother was here praying over me. I mean, it was just, she's with the Lord now, but, man, I remember running out into the parking lot when she was leaving one day, and I was going to go to Wales to film, and just kneeling down in the parking lot, just having her pray over me. I wanted, I wanted a generational blessing. You want that. You want to give it, and you want to receive it. Um, and so we have a multi-generational church um, that are, are here being equipped with a discipleship vision that is exceptional. I remember Sean, who's here in the room here, he and I took a hike up there. Um, Sean Patterson and his wife Amy are gifted young rock leaders. Another shot here with uh, John Houghton and Bob um, and Brandon. There he is looking a little younger there. But uh, Brandon's been a, a leader for years, 15 years at The Rock in various levels. Um, and Rachel as well. Rachel is a magnificent wife, mom, and prophetic leader. Uh, we have not seen the full height of, not that she's going to grow taller, but we have not seen the full <laughs> height of Rachel. She is a, she's a giant. Yes. She is a magnificent woman of God who is mindfully got four young kids. That takes a lot of time and effort and focus. But that lady, this lady, I'm very proud of you, Rachel, is going to uh, be mightily used by the Lord. And Brandon, again, um, Brandon has been discipling and ex-generation leaders for many years, uh, sending young leaders to China, to the nations of the world. Um, and they look to him. They receive him. So Brandon, next slide as well. He's an exemplary husband, father, 
a brilliant communicator. You know, I, I, I'm constantly looking at my notes. Brandon, you know, you think, does he ever look at his notes? I mean, he just gets up and just <laughs> rattling stuff off, you know. But I, I can feel brain cells dying. He said, I'm talking to you right now. I can just... <laughs> An exceptional leader and a discipler. And so the question is, you know, um, what is your role in the generational transfer? You know, will you be a part of what God wants to do? God is passing that baton on. God is saying, I believe in Brandon and Rachel. I believe in the next generation. I believe in what God has done and is doing. And so I want us to stand together. I want to invite uh, Brandon and Rachel to come up with Susie. And we're going to do something a little different. Grab a couple of chairs there. If someone could help with those chairs back there, that would be awesome. That would be great. Not you, Rachel. <laughs> She's ready to serve. There it is. Okay, we're going to face these two chairs this way. That's it. Just like this. Perfect, though. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Brandon? Rachel? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The thing you love. The thing you love. This is called a foot washing, guys. And um, we have not heard anything insidious about Brandon. No, nope. anything about Brandon's feet. There's been no rumors about it that have been spreading. They're technical, man. But let me let me say this. We are aware. We are aware. We can do this. It's double knotted. That's all right. Well, maybe it's not all right. Let's take a time. The next service starts at 2 o'clock. <laughs> oh, Brandon, I love you, baby. I know. You, you did it. If we, if we, can I? Yes, you may. I'll work on the next foot. Don't walk to port tighter. Don't do that either? No, so you have to undo it from the middle. So you grab it. After this could pick it. Have you ever had a foot washing with your shoe on? I had no idea he had a phobia about foot washing. I had no idea. He double knots his shoes, so it can't happen. There it is. Okay, dear, I'll work on that one. Is this one done? No. Unzip it, honey. Unzip it. Okay, there it is. Come on, there it is. Let me say this. Jesus, when he left the earth, the last thing he did at the Last Supper was wash the disciples' feet. And even though I'm not leaving the earth, this is a moment in time where I'm acknowledging there is a transfer that is taking place. And it is significant. And the highest role we can ever have is to be a servant. And so these are servant leaders. And we are washing their feet. Brandon, let me say this, my friend. I just want to pray. And, you know, I've been your pastor for 18 years. <laughs> and I'm sure there were some good moments. <laughs> and I'm not particularly concerned about those moments. But I just want to eliminate any vestige of any words any attitudes, any responses, anything I've said that has ever been unhelpful or unhealthy for you. And I also would say for my generation, anyone that has said or done anything to you, because it's very difficult to be that next generation leader coming up when people would rather have what they're familiar with, some of them. They'd rather just do what They've always done, and consequently, unfortunately, get the same results. Because God, again, is not watching reruns, eating leftovers, or doing anything. He's never duplicated a moment or a molecule. He's always got something fresh. And so, please forgive me for any words I've ever said, any attitudes you've ever had with me, anything I've ever communicated that has not been healthy or helpful to you. I love you. I honor you. I bless you. I'm, I'm getting it all off. And for anyone else that ever said or did anything to you in my generation that didn't understand how important the generational transfer is, it's gone. It's washed away. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. And so I'm going to wash your feet. 
and my beautiful wife Susie. Mark, you on with that, baby? I want to grab, I want to grab it, right? Um, I know I said this in the first service, but it's worth Is it repeating. On? Yeah, it's on. It's on. Um, we've been with. Um, people don't realize the journey that this couple has been on for the last decade, two decades. Uh, we've been part of the leadership. Uh, Brandon came almost two decades ago, and we sent out a couple churches in the beginning, and, and loads of kids went. I mean, the kids that he was had the journey with, that he was in the Lord with, that he had a relationships with, a lot of them went because we're, we sent a church to Rockland and to Granite Bay in the early days. And the group of kids that he bonded with, a lot of them went. And Brandon made a decision that God, the Holy Spirit, was asking him to stay. And so when everybody else was leaving, Brandon made the decision to stay. And, you know, it, it took hearing from the Holy Spirit, and it took a relationship of faith and believing of what, you know, of God was, had a future for him here. And then I know there's been many um, decisions that this couple has made that we realize has happened, but, you know, a lot of you don't. And then as a couple, after they got married, there was another season in their life where they were connected with other couples in the fellowship. Um, and then, or, and then as, the, as these other couples began to go another direction, even though they were bonded to them, the Lord said he wanted them to not sever, but to leave that group of kids that they're with, those couples, and to bond to the rock and to continue in the rock as leaders. And he was, um, you know, raising up young people. And I know it was a difficult season for them to make that kind of decision, but the Holy Spirit, they, I want to say the word trustworthy. They are, tr they are a trustworthy couple. They have made decisions you know, that has been very, very difficult, but they heard the Holy Spirit and they obeyed the Holy Spirit. And the, the word brave keeps coming, but brave equals trust. And they have trust the Holy Spirit along the way, not knowing where their future was gonna go, not knowing where their journey was gonna lead them, but God did. And because of your trustworthiness, because of making the right decisions when it was hard, you made decisions for the Lord and not yourself and not your own desires. God has brought you to this place. And we trust you. We believe in you. We love you. We say thank you for obeying the Holy Spirit. And we know this place is going to grow. And you're going to mentor many people. And you have a great influence on this next generation. You've been doing it for 20 years, almost, you know, Brandon and Rachel. And you will have a big influence. And you are mentoring hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that will go out of this place because of the influence that you've had on their life. And you are trustworthy, and we are so proud of you, and we love you. Amen. And we're Amen. thankful. Amen. You know, let's stand together. If, if you would like to, and I invite the other elders who are here, and deacons, and uh, community leaders, or anyone, just come and gather around them. We're just going to pray over them. And uh, if you want to just come up, you certainly can. But uh, let's just uh, agree together. Yeah. Father, we thank you, Lord, that... Um, another generation is being raised up, Lord. They don't have to do it our way, God. They don't have to say it our way. They don't have to think our thoughts. They have different priorities because they're facing different giants. They're facing different issues, and we reject the thought that somehow they are going to be clones of us or cookie cutter. They need to hear you, Lord. They are hearing you. We thank you, Lord, that they both have that desire in their heart to obey you. We thank you that their priority is their relationship with you. Their priority is their marriage together. Their priority is their relationship with their children. That's premier. From there, Lord, ministry can take place. But, Lord, we claim, Lord, that they will live healthy lives, that they will live safe lives that they will follow you and their children will follow you and their children's children will follow you. We speak a generational blessing over them, Lord. God, that the favor of the Lord would surround them. God, that you'd overtake them, Lord God. And even as that verse you gave me today in Habakkuk says, Lord, that, that uh, it would be hard to believe the incredible things you have in store, Lord. Even though today was amazing, the worship was amazing, Lord, and, and we know the word that comes forth and the leadership is incredible, Lord, greater days are even ahead, Lord. So we claim that 
for this marvelous couple, Lord. We bless them. We honor them today by the power of your spirit, Lord. Lord, take away, again, any insecurity, any fear, any discouragement, God. Any intimidation, Lord, any feeling that somehow uh, your grace is not sufficient, Lord, we claim that we will stand with them, Lord. They are not alone, Lord. Their future is bright because you wrote the script, and it truly is magnificent, Lord. So we honor them today. We speak life and peace and blessing and favor on them in every way. In Jesus' name. Susie, you want to pray something, dear? No, yeah, just one thing. Thank you, Lord. Father, I also ask God that you would raise up intercessors, Lord, in this house to cover this couple, Lord. We know that the bullseye is on them, Lord, even as the transfer happens, Lord, a greater responsibility and a greater target they will be. So, God, I ask that you would, even in the night hours, Lord, you would wake people up, God, and they'd pray for Rachel and Brandon and their family. God, that they would make the right decisions, Lord, that wisdom would rest in their hearts. God, that you would cover them and protect them, Lord, that a hedge would be about them, Father. God, that uh, there would the, the arrows from the enemy would not penetrate, but they would bounce off because of the hedge that's about them. So, God, we just ask for intercessors and people to uh, really take that responsibility of praying for them and honoring them, God. We just thank you so much for uh, bringing them, Father, to take the church to the next level. We pray a blessing over them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Give God a hand.